Oscar. Um, so we we stopped the course at uh, this slide. Our question was, which one of these models are the best? This one was the original model. That's the truth. You're playing God, so you know the true model. Here is a simple linear model that you use. So that's why you have a plane like this here. That is a plane you have here. And lastly, um, and, and, and next we have a spline that, that has almost the same shape as our um, original data set. It has same curvatures, and the good thing about it is it still has some, um, uh, some irreducible error here. Then we use another spline which passed through all possible points. So we discussed that this is not a good model at all because it's just... Uh, takes care of irreducible error as well. So one of the questions has, which one of the uh, models should be used? Um, uh, usually when you have a choice and your linear model does a good thing, um, always use the linear model. So simpler the better. So if I were me and I had this data set, I would probably use linear model, try to add some nonlinear terms to my linear model uh, instead of thin plate splines. It's not vaguely enough to take care of that. Um, so, so the trade-off between uh, fancy and simple models, uh, let's call the linear model as a simple model. Simple model, let's call it the linear model we had. And let's call the fancy model here is uh, fancy model spline that was good enough. So yeah, model, let's call it a spline. Uh, don't, don't worry about the splines. I teach you how to uh, find them. It's none of our business right now. I just want you to know there's a model called splines that take care of our uh, data the way I showed you. Uh, uh, whenever you want to use it for prediction, prediction act, if you just want to use it for prediction, maybe the fancy models does better, but if you want to use it for interpretation, uh, then use uh, simpler models like linear model because it's so easily interpretable. So, so for you to decide whether or not to use the model, uh, you only left with uh, two choices: whether you want to use interpretability or flexibility. Flexibility only comes in place when you want to use it for prediction. So I, I have listed a couple, um, couple of techniques that I'm going to describe. Subset selection lasso, it's uh, in chapter 6 of the textbook that may be going to be um, explained in this course. List of squares, which, which is uh, something that we are going to extensively uh, describe. Then we have generalized additive models and trees. And then we have bagging and boosting, which are some sort of um, addition to the trees flexibility and then we have support vector machines that I don't think I'm going to cover. One thing I want to mention is that if you look at the interpretability and flexibility um, uh, relationship, whenever you, for simpler models you have a lot of interpretability but it has lower flexibility. When you use more advanced models like bagging and boosting in trees or general additive models or support vectors, you have very high flexibility that means you can use it for prediction, but you have very low interpretability. So depending on the context you want to uh, work on, the models you use will be different. Usually in social science, we are, we are interested in interpre interpretability, in economics, the same. In business, the same. Um, in some application of business, like finance, we, we only care about prediction. In online marketing, we usually care about prediction. So depending on the context you use, um, one of these methods. As this graph progresses, um, we lose interpretability add to flexibility. Ideally, we wanted to have something here, but unfortunately, there is no model that is truly uh, flexible and truly interpretable. And I think other models that we developed, which were uh, neither interpretable nor flexible, were extinguished. So that's why we have this. Uh, this relationship. Okay. 
So assessing the model, it's very, very easy to overfit data. Specifically, if you use your training set, you threw in a lot of variables, you can reduce your mean square error as much as possible. So this is called mean square error. So basically when you have a training set like this, let me call this training set, the more variables you add to it, let's so call x1, x2, up to xn, or the more orders of polynomial you choose, the more flexible it becomes. So for example, let's call this f1x, let's call f1x1 as beta 0 simple linear model, uh, let's call it f2, which is a function of two variables, beta 0 plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2, and let's call this f3 of x1 and x2, which is not only uh, a function of x1 and x2 in a linear term, but also it has some nonlinear terms as well as the interaction effect. So this f1x is less flexible than f2, less flexible than f3. So the more flexibility you add, you can always decrease the mean square error on your training set. Training set is something that you use to teach your model. That's the part that your model observes. For instance, if you have 2,000 observations, say you have 2,000 observations, you can divide it to training and test set. Let's say you, um, you, uh, let's say you you put it, set aside 90% of the data as training and the less 10% as test data. The test data is the part that your model has never seen. So that's the part that your model doesn't observe and training set is the one that you use for your model. So ideally um, you want to have the lowest level of uh, mean square error on your test set and that's the average of the differences of your predictions and your real observations. Um, this is your observations, these are your model predictions. So, so the deal is you use your model on your training set, so you, you train it based on training set, you estimate fi hat xi's, so you, you find the you tune your parameters based on your training set. Then you use that training uh, trained model. Let's call it trained model. Trained model. And test it on your test set. So the model, uh, having some test set that hasn't, hasn't been observed in your training will give you peace of mind that it cannot be overfit. So let's see what will happen. Uh, there, there are a couple of interesting things that are going to happen. So let me first in introduce what is flexibility. It might be confusing a little bit. So um, let me focus on flexibility. Uh, the flexibility here is a simple definition in, in this graph. So this is the simplest model you can have. That's the model that, uh, so let's say you have two variables, x and y. The simplest model you have is beta zero. That means it only predicts same thing over time. The next challenging model would be this one that has two degrees of flexibility, degrees of freedom or flexibility. The next model you can have is uh, polynomial degree two. The next model you have is polynomial degree three and you can continue it up to polynomial 
order p. This has two levels of flexibility. The cubic model has three degrees of flexibility. This one has four degrees of flexibility. One thing to remember is that if you set beta 3 equal to 0, you get the previous model. If you set beta 2 to equal to 0, you get the previous model as well. So the more flexibility you have, the more functional forms and the more shapes you can get. So let's get, let me get back to my model. So here, truth is this black curve. That is truth. That is, that is what God knows. You do not know what it is, but that's what God knows. You have the simplest linear model that you can, that is this brownish, orangish shape. That's, that's the line that is being uh, put on my uh, training set. You can add to the flexibility of that. For example, this blue one has six degrees of flexibility. That is polynomial up to degree five. And this very weakly shape, this, um, this green one, has a very high level of flexibility. That's why it's weakly, it's curvy. And that has 21 degrees of freedom. So that is um, polynomial of degree 20. So now we want to see how good our model is doing. So we, we, we divide our data into test and training. So based on our training data, we train our algorithm. So these graphs are based on our training algorithm. Now we introduce our t test and unseen data to it. So let's see, this is one of our unseen um, observations. This is another one. This is another one. This is another one. And this is another one. So then, then, then we see how far away our predicted models are from this. So this grayish um, curve projects MSE versus flexibility. The more flexibility you add, the MSE of your training set, so that is MSE of your training set, decreases. Of course, um, a linear model has less training set, uh, more training set error than uh, the green one because green could, could set some of its coefficient to zero and become blue, and blue could set some of its coefficient to zero and become uh, brown. So if you just want to um, base your model based on this training set, you might be tempted to choose the one that has higher level of uh, flexibility. But that's not the case when you look over um, your variables only based on the test data. If you do that and you only consider it based on test data, remember um, these red points for test data, uh, then you get a different story. You will see that for this, uh, if truth was this black curve, the linear curve doesn't do that much well for MSE of our test data. However, when we get to the blue curve, which is, which is almost the same as our black, black curve, um, our MSE is minimized. Then uh, when you overfeed and you go after individual observations like that, uh, uh, you get the green one, again, the MSE of training set will increase. So the correct level of flexibility that uh, is this blue curve, is 6. That is polynomial of degree three, 5. Polynomial degree 5. The next slide gives another. So let's assume Truth is linear, so th this um, black curve is almost linear. And you, you want to run the same model. Of course, the less flexible model should be chosen in comparison to the previous, to the previous, um, I'm sorry, my, uh, of course the, the um, of course the lower level of flexibility should be chosen. Um, because it's the truth is linear, so let's see what will happen. We see that uh, minim, uh, the flexibility that minimizes our uh, test error is minimized at flexibility three, so it's actually polynomial of degree two. Um, and it makes sense because truth, which was the black curve, was very uh, linear and as you can see that uh, the test error only decreased marginally from degrees of freedom 2 which was a pure linear model and this one which was uh, slightly nonlinear. Here 
uh, we have a different story here. Truth is highly nonlinear. The black curve we have is highly nonlinear. Now we want to try to see which one is, uh, which degrees of freedom or which flexibility level does the best. Does the best. So this is truth. Truth is highly nonlinear. As you can see, this brown uh, curve, which is uh, completely linear, but it doesn't do well on our test set, neither in our test set nor in, in our training set, and that it is projected here, right? Um, as you improve your degrees of freedom or flexibility, it touches its minimum, then, then it becomes flat and goes slightly up. So the, the optimal level of flexibility you choose is level of flexibility 10, that is polynomial degree 9. Degree nine, but if I were to use this model, I would probably use five because five degrees of freedom is way less than ten, and the amount of um, the amount of improvement you see from five to ten is only marginal. It's almost flattened out from there. As I said, our first rule: simpler, the simpler, the better. Unless you see significant improvement by applying more sophisticated versions. So I stopped the course here. I'm going to get back to it later with some notions on um, bias variance uh, comparison and, of course, KNN algorithm.